Good morning. A true, viable, and excellent leadership is not about authority. It's about accountability. I'd like to begin by asking a question. What is the difference between manipulation and leading? Well, in regard to manipulation, it has a bad connotation, and justly so. Leadership is just the opposite. If someone is manipulating you, they are trying to get you to do something. If someone is leading you, they are trying to get you to do something also. Many of the tools are very similar, and sometimes... The difference is hard to differentiate. Whether that person is trying to manipulate you or are they trying to lead you? And so what is the difference between a person manipulating you or leading you? Well, it really boils down to if a person is manipulating you, they are trying to get you to do things that you don't want to do. They are pushing you down a path that you do not want to go. Maybe you're not fully aware of the consequences, the ramifications, and you're being manipulated to the advantage of that one who is trying to coerce you. If a person is leading you, they are trying to get you to do something that benefits you, not them. It is truly for your own good. So if someone is trying to get you to do something that you really want to do, whether at that time you understand or not the true outcome, it is still something that you would choose in the end. You are being led. So in other words... It really depends on the motivation of the person, whether they're trying to manipulate you, get you to do something against your will, or they're trying to lead you. But along with the concept of leading you, it may be against your will because you just don't realize what's good for you. But if you understood the end result, you'd be more than willing to be led. But you may feel manipulated to begin with. A good example of this would be a diet. When someone is putting restrictions on you or they're telling you you need to do this, 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 and you feel like you're being manipulated, but once you really get on board, you understand that this is for your own good. Maybe it's some kind of vice quitting a bad habit that you have, that you're hanging on to. Maybe it's a surgery that you needed. You just keep on putting it off because why? The rehab. Do you want to go through the rehab? No. (laughs) No one wants to go through the rehab. They just want to be fixed, right? So it may take someone leading you, not manipulating you, but leading you Convincing you you need to do this, the outcome is going to far outweigh the pain you're going through now, even if it is more pain to go through the process, through the rehab, than it would be just to tolerate your condition. So, you do not want to go through the pain, the sacrifice, the difficulties, but you finally know that it's worth it. The end outcome far outweighs whatever you have to endure for the moment. Quality, qualities of great leaders. I'm going to put these into three different categories. The first is a great leader is going to be a godly person. They're going to have a good moral compass, self-disciplined, full of integrity, ethical, just, honorable, honest, virtuous, and upright. They're going to maintain proper perspective, ideology, 
goals and are good problem solvers. In fact, they're strong, valiant, resilient, courageous, not easily intimidated, yet meek. Peacemakers are not looking for a fight, but they're not going to back down either is the point. They're willing to face opposition, adversity, trials, testing, and hard questions with tenacity and patience. A great godly leader is responsible, accountable, dependable, loyal, with sincere enthusiasm and passion for those around them. He has to be self-aware. He has to be willing to look in the mirror and see who he really is. He has to be authentic, flexible, open to criticism, yet determined. He has to be an excellent individual that engage, engages with the others, with others around him, a good listener. Not doing all the talking, but willing to listen. Recognizes strengths and flaws, always making within himself the needed adjustments. Always self-examining. He's not perfect. Willing to change, in other words. Setting the proper example to follow. Not the concept, do as I say, not as I do. And we'll address all these here in just a moment. And so he's self-aware with the desire to always improve. Now, of course, we're talking about elders. And we can see a contrast sometimes between some individuals and even elderships from time to time. That would be the implication. But I want you to look at this picture This was, of course, chosen intentionally, focusing on developing others. So he's got to be godly. He's got to be self-aware of his own flaws and strengths and always trying to make improvements. But it's not all about him. And I love this picture where this guy... You know, a young father, it would look, that is bridging the gap between these two round bells of hay. And what's happening? He's got children (laughs) walking across him. He's bridging the gap from one place to the next. And it is that concept of focused on developing others. And so we would say, number one, truly cares and is concerned for others, empathizing whenever possible. I haven't lost a spouse. I don't I haven't been through that, so I can't truly empathize. I can sympathize, but I can't empathize. I can't really relate. I can feel for you, but I can't feel with you. Is the concept. But if I can, I should. Seeing the potential of others and inspiring them to also become better. Mentoring, encouraging, admonishing, and sacrificing for them. Pushing people out of their comfort zones. Because you and I both know I'm happy where I am, leave me alone. (laughs) Is the primary concept of many Christians. Don't tell me I need to memorize any verses. Don't tell me I have to be here on a Wednesday night for Bible class. Don't tell me how long my shorts have to be. Don't tell me this. Don't tell me that, you see. Don't tell me what I should be pursuing. Don't tell me I need to set goals. Don't tell. And we build these walls because people are uncomfortable leaving their situation, whatever that is. And that's why I began like I did as far as what is leading and what is 
manipulating. Is it good for you to stay where you are? Or do you see the benefit of improving? A good leader is always going to be challenging you. Trying to, in a sense, rather pull, lead, push, (laughs) but you understand the concept. Help others think for themselves. A good leader realizes he doesn't have all the answers and he needs input from others. And that they reach the point where they can think for themselves. They can come up with the concepts, with the goals, with the aspirations, if you will. And it's not always the leader. Delegating responsibility while letting go of the reins, but always supportive. This is huge, huge. The way I want to describe this is that that person who owns the business and is at the point of growth, but he's got to get himself out of the business so that he can bring up people who go and do the work that he once did. But if you're the carpenter who's always been the carpenter, it's very, very difficult to step out of swinging a hammer and giving that responsibility to others. It it is vital for growth of any company for that to happen. So this delegating is that idea that you are giving someone else the responsibility, and that's the letting go of the reins, but you're always there to help. In an eldership, and I'm just going to in, in, introduce some of these concepts, and you hopefully you'll have opportunity to mull them over. The eldership doesn't control everything. That's part of the reason for deacons. Deacons do the work. The elders oversee. The apostles understood that it wasn't going to be beneficial for the kingdom for them to go and serve these Grecian widows. That that needed to be handled by someone else. What they needed to do is focus their attention on preaching the word. Same concept. And so what is absolutely necessary is great communication skills with the ability to convict Convict the gangsayer, convict those who are wrong, convince is another way to put that, motivate, and ultimately to achieve some given goal. Those are the challenges that we have before us in looking for overseers for this congregation. And if we don't start thinking about it, we'll never think about it. If we don't start pursuing it, then young men like Aiden and Dylan and so on will just not have the aspirations. And it starts at a young age. And we see the wisdom of God set forth in His Word. But I want to shift gears just a little bit And hopefully, I will put the pieces together that will make sense. So I've laid a a large foundation for us now to start building on, if you will. But the foundation is larger than the building. Most horrible example of leaders is guess who? The Pharisees. They were horrible. Jesus doesn't pull any punches. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 1, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. You see, they sit in a place of authority. They are to be 
the advisors. They are the ones to be looked up to. They are the ones who are going to tell everybody how they ought to live their life, if you will. Which, there's some legitimacy to that. But notice, it says, Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. Why? For they say and they do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. It's the title, the recognition. We don't need men like that. It goes on to say, they make their phylacteries broad. And I guess I should have put a picture of a phylactery. A lot of people think that that's at the end of their robe. The phylactery, if you'll go and look it up, just Google it, it's no big deal. The phylactery was a leather band that went around the arm. It had a box here that was, it was on the left side and it was close to the heart. And it had some scriptures in it. You can go and look it up for yourselves. And so to broaden their phylactery was to broaden that leather band that strap, that thong, you might say, that went around the, the arm. And it was like saying, look at me. I'm a very pious and religious individual. Doesn't say anything about frontlets. Frontlets was where they had a box and there were specific scriptures uh, in that box. And it went around the head as a band, like a headband with a box of these scriptures. And there was that, that box also in the phylactery. See, they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. You see the picture painted by Jesus. These are people who are in it for the glory. For the glory of themselves, the glory of men. Well, that's enough of the negative. Let's talk about the most excellent example of a great leader. The first is that, of course, it's Jesus. But guess what? Jesus can't lead you where you don't want to go. Would Jesus take you out of your comfort zone? Would Jesus call upon you to excel more? Would Jesus prompt you to exercise mentally God's Word? Would Jesus be a motivation? Well... In John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, Most surely I say to you, he who, excuse me, uh, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And what we see within that phrase that the mutual recognition one to the other. Jesus recognizes the sheep and the sheep recognize his voice. They know who he is. And so he continues to him. The doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Leads. And when he leads or when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow. You see, there's the lack of that prompting, that pushing in that sense, is it not? For they all, for they know his voice, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Why didn't they understand? Did they understand because they were comfortable where they were? Did they not understand because they're okay 
They don't need any leadership. Did they not understand because they don't see the value of following God, following Jesus, following the shepherd? Did they not understand because I'm okay. Jesus will never lead you down a path that's not beneficial for you. He's not a manipulator. It's not, he's not in it for himself. He leads because he knows what's good for us. When we disregard that there is a necessity for shepherds or for a shepherd, referring to Jesus Christ, we know we're in trouble. If we can't associate that we wouldn't, or if we can understand the, how we are led and how we would follow Jesus, then we need to also see within every congregation there should be those who also lead. For the right reasons, of course. Because what we would see in our shepherd is that he was willing to suffer. Suffer. The question is, do we have men who are willing to rise up, not to be praised by men, but willing to suffer? <laughs> in First Peter chapter, or oh, excuse me, in Second Timothy chapter three, verses ten through twelve, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, Paul writing to young Timothy. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to be at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But we might say, yeah, I'll suffer persecution, but just right here. <laughs> mm, don't want to go any further. Now, this is everybody. This applies to everybody. This isn't talking about leaders. What it is talking about is Paul's willing to, willingness to set the example of suffering. We need those kinds of examples before us. Now, we shouldn't be a burden to the eldership. We shouldn't make their job more difficult. But I'm sorry, it just goes with the territory. Now, we have to ask ourselves, and I'm not talking to any one person, and I'm just looking at this in general as an overall, who's not willing to suffer? Who's not willing to pay the price? So, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, this applies to everybody, not overseers, shepherds, presbyters, that you should follow His steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit, found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus is that most excellent leader because He's willing, as we see, to suffer, which we emphasize again. You and I are going to suffer, but it's because our leader has suffered. And so, fourthly, the Lord's way is, is the best way. How many of y'all want to go on a diet today? 
no more sugar, no more carbs, you know, whatever it is for you. I don't know. Do you see the benefit at the end? And you have to count the costs and you go, well, is it really worth it? In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 through 30, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. That's interesting. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest in your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a yoke. We bear it with Christ. We suffer with Christ. We suffer together. But coupled with that, is that learn from me. Where would we draw the line in the sand and go, I'm only willing to go so far in paying the price in regard to what Christ has done for me? And don't we understand that the end result far outweighs anything we have to endure here in this life? And I wonder if it's... Be- that people do not want to go into a leadership role, become a shepherd, an overseer, because, <laughs> because of these things. Because of the suffering, not willing to pay the price. But, you know, I'm okay where I am. I don't have to. And then this fourth, we really don't think that we have to, that it's not really the best way. We can do it this other way and it's okay. It still gets the job done. We're not picking elders anytime soon, not that I know of. So I'm not throwing, you know, something out here and next thing you know, next week we're going to be, you know. But if we don't think about it, I've already been told I talk too much about evangelism, which I'm still like going, I'm a plumber. I talk about plumbing. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, I don't, I don't understand it. I'm lost. I was fully aware you didn't have elders, right? It's not news to me. But at the same time, I'm not just going to go, eh, eh, I know. God says, Timothy appointed elders at every church. But we don't have to. If we don't work towards that goal, where are we going to be in another 20 years? Because ultimately, we have to ask the question, are we led by the Spirit? Do we believe God's Word? Do we understand that it is a chart? It it is a, a path that leads to the true righteousness of God, the right way, the best way, God's way. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed, and I know we keep on emphasizing this, right? Because we're all in this together. If, if you are not an heir, You're not willing to meet this condition, if you will. So if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And you know what Paul went through. All all these beatings and stonings and uh, left for dead and in, in perils of water, perils from his countrymen, perils outside, you know, the, the, those people who weren't his countrymen. And, I mean, he was just willing to go through anything. And it comes back to down to that idea, are we willing to pay 
the price. And that's why we talk about needing valiant men, determined men, men with purpose, men who are willing to live for others, to sacrifice, to pay a price. And if we do not instill that in the next generation, what's going to happen to the Lord's church? And every congregation needs good Great leadership. And I will emphasize this in a little bit more detail uh, in another lesson. But ultimately, good leaders never manipulate. You and I know, whether I like it or not, I'm somewhat of a leader. I, I, I am not an overseer. I am not a pastor. I'm not an elder. I aspire to be someday somewhere. But I am not right now. But being the preacher carries somewhat of that just because of teaching and preaching the concept of leading. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that I have no intentions of ever manipulating you. But in my way, just as in your way, because we're all leaders, someone is looking at you. Male or female. We're not talking about you know, an eldership. You are influencers. You are influencing others. So I'm begging you to lead in a way that is sacrificial and looks out for the best interest of others. And it's just happenstance that isn't that what I was trying to emphasize that we find in John chapter 3 and verse 16? Agapeo love. It's not that God in that sense had a had his heartstrings being pulled for us. He just understood our condition and that we needed help and He was willing to help. But He helped to the point of giving His Son as a sacrifice for us. And then He just says, follow My Son. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow Me. He doesn't make us. We're not recruited. Isn't it beautiful? that we have that free will that we can choose? That we can decide for ourselves whether He is really looking out for our best interest or not. You get that? We decide for ourselves, is He really, is He trying to manipulate me or is God trying to lead me? Is what He tells me in His Word for my best interest or not. How we respond to that agapeo love will determine the kind of servant I will be. If I believe that it is truly agapeo love and that He is wanting to lead me for my own best interest. I would even venture to say, it, although it is certainly to His glory, but it's not in a selfish way. We addressed that a few Sundays ago. It really is out of love. And so we have to ask ourselves, how will I respond to that? Will I become even more of a servant? Will I try to uh, grow 
and to mature and take upon myself the responsibility of the souls of others. That's a huge task and it's a huge sacrifice. But it's one that our leader, our shepherd, has already made for us.